Hello and welcome to HelpYourMath.com. In this video, we're going to do two things. We're going to summarize the transformations of functions, and then we're also going to look at transformations of functions of the parent functions. So first, let's talk about the summary of transformations. We have two types of transformations. The rigid transformations, where the shape stays the same, it's just the shape either moves around the graph or it might flip upside down. And then we have the non-rigid transformations on the next slide. So we have three types of rigid transformations. We can have vertical shifts, that's where the graph moves up or down, and that's when we have our new function and there's something being added to the original function. So we see a plus something outside of the function. If that thing that's being added is positive, it's gonna move the graph up. If it's negative, it's gonna move the graph down. Next, we have horizontal shifts. That's where there's something happening within the function. So notice here that it's within the parentheses, it's happening inside the function. It's gonna move the graph this one's like the backwards one. It moves the graph to the left. When h is positive, it's gonna to go to the left when h is positive, and it's gonna to go to the right when h is negative. So it seems counterintuitive, right? With the vertical, it makes sense. It's positive, it goes up. It's negative, it goes down. With horizontal shifts, it's the opposite. It has to work harder when it's positive, so it moves the graph to the left. And lastly, we have reflections. So if we see a negative, uh, in front of the entire function, that's gonna reflect the graph about the x-axis. And if we have a negative within the function, that's gonna reflect the graph about the y-axis. For our non-rigid transformations, we have two types. We have vertical distortions. That's when we have a multiplier outside of the function. And it would be a vertical stretch. When I say the absolute value of a, just when looking only at the positive piece, whatever a is, if it's bigger than one, that's a vertical stretch. If it's in between zero and one, that's a vertical shrink. If there's a multiplier within the function, that's a horizontal distortion. And when that value is bigger than one, the absolute value of it, that's a horizontal shrink. When it's in between zero and one, that's a horizontal stretch. Okay, let's get to the good stuff and look at examples of transformations. We're gonna focus on absolute value, quadratic, cubic, reciprocal, and square root functions. If you don't already know the parent functions to these, you need to stop this video now Go back and watch the video on parent functions because otherwise this video is going to be really, really tough. Let's go. So our first example, we're going to sketch a graph of g of x equals the absolute value of x minus 3 plus 2. What's happening here? First, let's identify the parent function. The parent function here is our absolute value function. That would be f of x equals the absolute value of x. That graph looks like a v pointed up and it has key points such as the vertex down here of 0, 0. It also has like points 1, 1. And over here it would have negative 1, 1. It would also have 2, 2 and negative 2, 2. Okay, so how is g different? Well, it's shifted to the right three units. I know it's shifted to the right because of the minus 3 within the absolute value. So this means it's going right three units. And this here outside the absolute value means that we have a vertical shift of two units up. So it's going up two. How I would start this graph is with the vertex. So the vertex is nice and easy to use because the starting points are zero, zero. Going to the right three means we're gonna add three to every point, uh, to every x value. So that means the vertex will now be at three. The up two means we're gonna add two to all the y values. So the vertex would now be at three, two. That would be here, three, two. We wanna graph a few more points. Now the shape of this graph is exactly the same as the parent function. It's just moved in the coordinate plane. So that means to get to another point, I would go up one and over one. Up one and over one. I would do the same to the left. I'm gonna go up one, over one. Up one, over one. And then I'm gonna connect my beautiful graph here. Oh dear, oh I missed all the points, didn't I? <laughs> Let's try that again. And that's what our graph should look like. So it's the same shape as what the, the parent function is. It's just moved three units to the right and up three units. And you can see I drew the graph in, in PowerPoint and I nailed the graph with the blue. Go me. Um, but that's what the, the new graph would look like. Okay, our next example, we have h of x equals one half x squared minus four. What's the parent function? Well, I see this x squared. That indicates to me we're talking about a quadratic function. So here f of x would be x squared. That is a parabola pointing up, and we have some key points here. This one also has a vertex, and the parent function, the vertex is at zero, zero. 
Some other key points on this graph would be 1, 1 and 2, 4. We would also have negative 1, 1 and negative 2, 4. So both the absolute value and the quadratics have a special type of symmetry about some vertical line. Okay, for our graph of H, I'm going to figure out the transformations and then we'll, we'll go from there. We're going to talk about this one because we do have a, a, an issue here. So there's no change to the x-coordinate of the vertex, but there is a change to the y-coordinate. Because this minus 4 is happening outside of the function, right? It's not happening where the x is, it's happening away from it. That's going to be a vertical transformation. It's moving it up 4. So the new vertex would be at 0. I'm sorry, it's moving it down 4. It's negative, so it's going down 4. Down 4. Okay, so 0, negative 4. Now the half that's happening within the function, that is a vertical shrink. So it's shrinking the graph down. These can be really tricky. And so what I suggest doing is creating a table of values to help with this. And you could always, always, always use a table of values. So for the last example, if you don't like my weird strategy, you could have used a table of values. Whenever you're going to create a table of values, you want to find that special point. So the special point on all the parent functions always happens to be usually at zero, zero. Um, now, in this case, it's 0, negative 4. So when I build my table, this is h of x, I'm going to put 0 in the middle, so 0, negative 4. I want to choose two that are smaller than 0, probably in this case negative 2 and negative 1, and two that are bigger than 0, such as 1 and 2. Because this graph is symmetric, if I know the value for 1, then I know the value for negative 1, 2. It's going to have the same output, so I kind of can cheat my way through and do half the work. If I plug in 1, I get 1 squared is 1, and then 1 half times 1 is 1. 1 half minus 4 is negative 3 and a half. And that's going to be the same for negative 1, right? Because if you square negative 1, you also get 1. Okay, what about 2? 2 squared is 4. So 2 squared is 4, and then half of 4 is 2, and 2 minus 4 is negative 2. So whether the value, the input is 2 or negative 2, the output is 2. Now we're ready to graph, although the, the halves are a little bit tricky. If you want to plug in 4 also, that might be a good idea to give us another point. So I might do that just because 4 is even, so when I take half of it, I'm going to get an even number. And what value, what other uh, x value will give me the same y value? Negative 4. So 4 and negative 4 should give me the same output. If we plug in 4 or negative 4, that's going to be 1 half times 4 squared is 16. Negative 4 squared is also 16 minus 4. Half of 16 is 8, and 8 minus 4 is 4. Okay, so that just gives me additional points. I didn't have to do that necessarily. So starting with the vertex, 0, negative 4 is down here. Then I have negative 1, negative 3 and a half is probably like right here. Oh, sorry, 1, 1, 1. Negative 1 is over here. Then 2, negative 2 is down here. Negative 2, negative 2 is down here. 4, 4 is up here. Negative 4, 4 is up here. This is a parabola, it's a smooth curve, so no sharp points on this one like the absolute value function. And just to check my work, there's the graph uh, when I did it on the computer. Mine was pretty good. So you can see all it did is it took the graph and it shifted it down, and there was also that vertical shrink. There was the vertical shrink because of that one half. Next up we have m. m of x is equal to negative x plus 1 cubed. So our parent function here is the cubic function, f of x equals x cubed. And this one, it doesn't have a vertex, but it does have a special point at 0, 0. It's when it shifts direction, right? So here it's facing down, facing down, facing down. It gets to 0, 0. Now it's going up, 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 up. Um, other key points on this, so we have 0, 0. Other key points we have are 1, 1 and 2, 8. And then on the other side, we have negative 1, negative 1 and negative 2, negative 8. So those are some key points from our parent function. How does that help us here? Well, let's see. Whoa, wait a minute. Okay, first of all, I see this negative. So this negative is going to reflect it over the x-axis. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. So while the parent function looks like that, the uh, new function, the transformed function, is going to look like that because it's going to be reflected over the x-axis. And then this plus 1 within the function is moving the graph to the left. So whereas we have this cool point at 0, 0, now it's moving to the left one unit. 
So it's going to be at negative 1, 0. This one can be tricky, so if you want to make a table of values, that's always okay. Oh, you know what? I think the graph is going to be up there. So I'm going to make my table of values down here. So we have x and m of x. I'm going to put negative 1 in the middle. And now I want to choose two points that are smaller than negative 1. I'm going to use negative 2 and negative 3, and two that are bigger, 0 and 1. When I plug in negative 2, I have negative, negative 2 plus 1 cubed, and negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, negative of negative 1 is 1. That's a mouthful. Okay, what about negative 3? We have negative, negative 3 plus 1 cubed, Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. Negative 2 cubed is 8. Uh, it's negative 8, excuse me. Negative 8. And then the negative of negative 8 is positive 8. Okay, going down now. These numbers might seem familiar. We see the, the 8s here and the 1 and the 1 and the 8. And that's no coincidence. That's absolutely what should happen within these functions. That's why we choose that, that special center point. Okay, when we plug in 0. Oh, yay, 0. 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 cubed is 1, then we negate it, we get negative 1. And lastly, when I plug in 1, I should end up with negative 8, but let's just verify. I have negative 1 plus 1 cubed, 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 cubed is 8, we negate it, negative 8. Perfect. Okay, so negative 3, 8 is up, uh oh, it's off my graph, it's probably like right up here. Negative 2, 1 is right here. Negative 1, 0 is right here. 0, negative 1 here, and 1 I'm off the screen again. So our graph should look something like this. That's the actual graph when I do it on the, the, the calculator on the computer. Much nicer than mine. I'm going to erase mine because that one looks so much better. Just so you can see. But you can see all the points were the same. I just can't graph these things real nice. So we have negative 2, 1, 0, 0. And that's what the graph of this cubic would look like. Okay, in this example, we have f of x equals the square root of x plus 5 plus 1. Our parent function, I can't use f, so I'm going to use g. g of x is equal to the square root of x. The graph looks something like this, and some key points for our square root function, we may recall. This one is unique because it just goes one direction, whereas everything else has gone left and right. This one starts at 0, 0. And then we have 1, 1, 4, 2, and 9, 3, right? You want to choose x values that are perfect squares. So what's happening here is taking that graph of this, these points and something that looks like this, and it's shifting it to the left five units, so we have negative five, and it's shifting it up one unit. So instead of starting at zero, zero, this graph is going to start at negative five, oops, not negative one, positive one, negative five, positive one. If you want to make a table of values because it can be comforting to like know the exact points, you're more than welcome to. If you want to just use the transformations, you can do that too. For the table of values, this time we don't start in the middle, we're going to start at negative 5, 1. And then we're going to use the parent function to help guide us choose correct and good x values, right? I say good x values because we are talking about a square root. We want to plug in things that are going to give us perfect squares. So the next thing that we would do is we want to go over 1 to the right. So I'm going to go over 1 to the right from negative 5, that's going to put me at negative 4. Negative 4 should give me a perfect square if I plug it in. That would be negative 4 plus 5 under the radical. That's 1. The square root of 1 is 1, and 1 plus 1 is 2. Perfect. Now, I don't want to use negative 3, because if I use negative 3, I get negative 3 plus 5 under the radical, which is the square root of 2, which is something irrational. So that's why I don't just pick the next four points after negative 5. No, I want to be very careful here. Now I want to go 4 to the right of negative 5. That would be negative 5 plus 4 is negative 1. When I plug in negative 1, negative 1 plus 5 is uh, 4, and the square root of 4 is 2. 2 plus 1 is 3. So there I get 3. Lastly, I want to go 9 to the right of negative 5. 9 to the right of negative 5 would be positive 4. I plug in positive 4, I get 4 plus 5 under the radical, which is 9. The square root of 9 is 3, and 3 plus 1 is 4. Okay, so now I have some points. We have negative 4, 2 right there, uh, negative 1, 3, and 4, 4 is up there. So this graph should look something like that. Let's compare it to the real graph. Nope. There's the real graph. Excuse me. Go back. 
Okay, so the computer's being a little slow, but you, you saw that I generally had the, the right shape. Okay, two more examples. This one here, our parent function f of x is our reciprocal function, 1 over x. 1 over x is kind of a weird one. Um, the zeros play an important role in that those are things that they get approached, but they never get reached. So the normal graph for this would be up in quadrant 1 and down in quadrant 3, and it looks something like that. But I look at this and I see this negative here that indicates to me that we have that reflection over the x-axis, putting the graph in quadrants 2 and 4 instead. So this is going to reflect about the x-axis. And this minus 2 is going to shift the graph down two units. So where we normally have a break at 0, now it's going to be down here at 2. Sometimes what we do is we use a dashed line to represent that, and a dashed line just to help us. Those are called asymptotes, and it just helps us know what to avoid. Um, this one you can do some key points. I generally, for this, just like to look at the basic shape of the graph. I, it doesn't have to be perfect by any stretch of the imagination. And so the graph would look something like this. Whoops, I just said it couldn't be in quadrant one. Let's try that again, because the negative is reflecting it. So there's going to be one here, and there's going to be one here. If you want to do a table of values, that's fine. You just can't use zero. So you could use, and what I would do for the reciprocal function is I would do negative two, negative one, and negative half, and then half, one, and two, because it is a reciprocal function. When you take the reciprocal of these things, you know, you can take the reciprocal of a half, you're going to end up with two. So that's going to give you a whole number output. The real graph looks like that. So you can see I was a little bit off, but I had the state, the, basically the, the shape in mind, and that's what's really important here. Okay, last example. g of x is equal to negative 4 times the absolute value of x plus 3 plus 5. We've got everything going on to this absolute value function. So this is absolute value, right? The normal absolute value is 0, 0, 1, 1, negative 1, 1. 2, 2, negative 2, 2. This one's got everything. We've got a reflection over the x-axis. We've got a stretch, a vertical stretch. This is moving the graph to the left three units. This is moving the graph up five units. So I'm going to start with the vertex here. The vertex is going to be at negative 3, 5. Negative 3, up 5. And now, because I've got that stretch and I've got the negative, maybe it's best to make a table of values. Um, this is going to get really tall really quickly thanks to that stretch. So let's see, I'm working around negative 3. So I want to go 2 above, 2 below negative 3, negative 5 and negative 4, and 2 bigger than negative 3, negative 2, negative 1. This is a nice symmetric graph. So negative 5 and negative 1, because they're both two units from negative 3, give me the same output. Negative 4 and negative 2 will also give me the same output. So you get to choose which one to plug in. Um, if I plug in negative 5, negative 5 plus 3 is negative 2, but the absolute value of negative 2 is 2. 2 times negative 4 is negative 8, and negative 8 plus 5 is negative 3. So for negative 5 and negative 1, the output is 3. And hopefully that, or negative 3. And hopefully that makes sense that those are going to be the same, because whether you plug in negative 5 or negative 1, you're going to get that absolute value equaling 2. Okay, how about negative 4 and negative 2? I'll plug in negative 2 this time. So if I plug in negative 2, negative 2 plus 3 is 1. The absolute value of 1 is 1. 1 times negative 4 is negative 4, and negative 4 plus 5 is 1. So this is going to give me 1 and 1. Now I have something to go on. I have negative 5, negative 3 down here. Negative 4, negative, uh, sorry, let's try it again. Negative 4, 1 up here. Negative 3 I already have. Negative 2, 1 up here and negative 1, negative 3 down here. So really stretched out graph, looks something like that. And of course, let's look at the real graph. There's the real graph there. These have been examples of transforming parent functions. Thank you for stopping by.